Good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Julia Shumway. I cover the State Senate for the Arizona Capital Times, and I'll be the moderator of this evening's debate. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is the sponsor of this event. As the state's voter education agency, Clean Elections hosts debates so voters have the opportunity to hear directly from candidates, ask questions on the issues that matter most to them, and vote informed. Candidates with a contested general election have been invited to participate in the debate. Candidates who opted into Clean Elections Clean Election Funding Program are required to participate, while traditional candidates like the three joining us tonight are invited and encouraged to attend. Please note that candidates from both the Senate and the House are participating in tonight's debate. The questions asked this evening are coming directly from voters. Leading up to the debates, Clean Elections conducted outreach to voters across the state, soliciting questions for candidates. But if you're watching live, you can still submit a question at any time by emailing debates at kc-a.com, <coughs> texting 928-362-1062, or calling 480-937-1297. Please specify if your question is for a specific candidate or for all candidates. We will screen questions for clarity to eliminate duplications, speeches, or personal attacks on candidates. The debate is scheduled for an hour, so we may not get to all audience questions, but we will do our best. Candidates, you will have one minute for opening and closing statements and one to two minutes for your responses to voter questions. We'll encourage an open exchange of dialogue between opponents. If you feel the need to respond to another candidate's comments, you may do so, but I may limit responses for time management purposes. And remember that this is a respectful, courteous, and professional environment. Our goal tonight is to connect candidates and voters so the electorate may vote informed. Candidates running for the state Senate in LD20 are Republican incumbent Senator Paul Boyer and Democrat Doug Irvin. Candidates running for the state House are incumbent Republican representatives Shauna Bullock and Anthony Kern and Democratic candidate Judy Schwiebert. Neither Senator Boyer nor Representative Bullock were able to join us tonight. Mr. Boyer has a class for his master's degree and Ms. Bullock is taking her son to college. So we're going to go ahead and start introductions with uh, Mr. Irvin. Would you please start our opening remarks? Well, thank you very much to the Clean Elections Commission for hosting this event and my fellow candidates who made it here this evening. I mean, my parents, an Air Force captain and a nursing teacher instilled in me Arizona values like respect, integrity, community service, hard work, and personal responsibility. But when I was down at the legislature, I saw there were too many lawmakers who did not bring those values, especially when they put party before people, gave money away to special interest groups, and worst of all, put their own personal political ambitions ahead of the well-being of our kids. That's why I'm using my business experience and accounting background to bring fiscal responsibility to the state so we can properly fund our schools. So every student has a chance to get a great education. People can access quality, affordable health care, and we can make smart infrastructure investments. And all these things will help create jobs and grow our economy. I mean, now more than ever, we need elected officials who actually listen to the citizens in our community, work together to solve problems, and actually serve with integrity. So that's why I'm running to be your next state senator. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move on to the House, starting with Mr. Kern. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Anthony Kern. I'm your current state representative for LD20, Legislative District 20. I'm honored to be a part of this, and I look forward to a robust debate. I originally grew up in Minnesota with a family of 13 brothers and sisters. My mom and dad grew, uh, grew up in central Minnesota and moved down here about 35 years ago. I've lived in Legislative District 20 for about 15, uh, about 15 to 20 years. I haven't even counted, but uh, I have uh, raised my children here in Glendale, Arizona, and uh, I am honored to represent the district at the state capitol. I, I believe firmly in free speech. I believe in, in a quality education for our students. I believe in, uh, in, in, in a robust business environment where jobs are created, and I believe in policies that make that happen. Uh, right now, we live in unprecedented times, and uh, I, I, you know everybody is, is just kind of taking it day by day, and, and I firmly believe that as a leader in this, in this community, that I can work across the aisle, I can work with fellow Republicans and Democrats to ensure that our citizens have what they need 
uh, whether it be unemployment insurance or small business protection, uh, and, and continue to create the jobs that, that I think we've done a, a fantastic job in doing in the past six years since I've been at the Capitol. So I am honored to be here. I look forward to the debate and I appreciate everyone's time. A little bit more about me. I wanted to tell everyone that I am a law enforcement officer. I do support the police. I absolutely support the Second Amendment. And uh, and I look forward to uh, to seeing where the other candidates stand on, on some of those issues. And uh, I just want to say that I'm happily married, four kids, beautiful wife, Jenny, and uh, we're, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Schwebers. Thank you so much, Julia, and thank you, Anthony and Doug. It's an honor to be here with everyone, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight. So I grew up in Phoenix, where my dad supported our family of five on his uh, job as a, a shop teacher at Carl Hayden High School, and he and my mom taught us the importance of education and hard work and respect for other people. And I have spent all of my adult life here in LD20. I think I've been here since 1977. It's where I raised my two now grown successful sons, uh, where I've been a community leader, um, where I was a co-founder of Theater Works, and where I have been a teacher for 27 years at Greenway and Cactus High Schools in our district. You know, I never imagined that I would be running for public office, but as a mom and a grandmother and a teacher, it breaks my heart that last year alone, Arizona had children in over 1,800 classrooms who had no permanent certified teacher. And that's because of the failure of our legislature. We can and must do better. So now more than ever, I know that we will all do better when we're listening and working together in a bipartisan and multi-partisan way so that every Arizona gets their chance to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. And I will get right into questions. This first question is for all three candidates and we'll stick with the, the same order, starting with Mr. Irvin. Students around Arizona returned to in-person classes today for the first time since March after warnings from health professionals, school board members, and Superintendent of Public Instruction Kathy Hoffman that resuming in-person instruction is unsafe. Should Arizona have reopened schools? And as lawmakers, what can you do to ensure students, teachers, and school staff are safe in their classrooms? Yeah, I'm a volunteer tutor for second graders. And so I know children learn best when they're actually in class, but they also learn better when they're healthy. They learn better when their peers and their teacher and their family is healthy. So that's the top priority is to make sure everybody's staying healthy. I'm glad that the metrics got put out a few weeks ago. So we have some good benchmarks to work for so that everybody can be working together because that's what we need to be doing as a community in a state is all working together, all rowing in the same direction, listening to the health experts in the society to do this. Now, I believe in local control, so school board should be making these decisions, and I'm glad that they've got the metrics to do so. I would prefer that they really follow the metrics and the guidelines, and so when they get that green light is when the time to do it. But as start state leaders and legislators, one thing we should be doing is showing as an example, taking the measures. So when the governor says, wear a mask, let's wear a mask. Even when the vice president, when the pe president says it's patriotic to wear a mask, make sure we're social distancing properly. That's what we need to be doing so that we can get our schools open, we can get our economy going, we get our small businesses open. And legislators also need to be working together in a bipartisan way to get the uh, the money and the tools that are needed for the schools. And if the governor is not doing the things he needs, the legislature needs to step in and say, hey, this is what needed is needed. This is what our community is asking for. Because that's what I'm always going to be doing, is seeing what our community needs and working for those members first. Great. And moving on to Mr. Kern. Thank you, Julie. I, I appreciate the question. And thank you to the voter that proposed it. I agree with Doug on a lot of points, and I want to say that uh, should the schools reopen, that is a, in my opinion, a, a, the choice of the parent. There's a lot of fear out there because of this pandemic. It's unprecedented times, and I think the parents should be given the choice of whether or not they should allow their kids back in school in a safe way. I think schools could reopen safely if we give them the tools and the money to do that. 
And I think that uh, uh, the parents should be able to choose whether or not they want to do, teach their student online or allow their student to go back to, to public school. That being said, I've heard from a lot of parents in the district, and uh, there is a lot of concern about their children not going back into school. Parents need to get back to work, and, and they have no one to watch their children as they as they teach in their home, as their kids learn online. So there's a there's a, a bunch of things here that we need to look at. I agree with Doug uh, and as far as the metrics, and I see the numbers going down. So I'm I'm pretty confident that Arizona has taken a turn and, and the numbers continue to go down on a daily basis. But that being said, there again is still a lot of fear out there. And I support uh, parents on whether or not they want to send their kids back to school. I do also believe in local control. And I think the local school board should should make that decision and based on their uh, their elected capacity and what they hear from the parents, but mainly from the parents that I've heard from, uh, they want their kids going back into school in a safe way. So I do have two polls on my webs on my Facebook and on my Instagram accounts. And with that specific question, it says, should schools be allowed to reopen? And if the voters would please go to my Facebook page and my Instagram page and take that poll and give me their feedback, I'd be more than happy to uh, to take that and, and analyze it and make decisions based off that. I also really agree with Doug on the on the part that we need to work in a bipartisan manner. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with who's ever at the legislature and this, uh, whoever wins this next election, working at the legislature with them and coming up with common sense approaches to, to, to this again, pandemic that none of us have ever, ever experienced before in our lives and hopefully we'll never experience again. Thank you. Great, and Ms. Schwiebert, the same question. Thank you, Julia. Um, so first of all, as a mom and a grandma, I get it. I want my grandkids back in school because we know that that's the best place for them, us, for their social development, emotional development, as well as for academics. And I know that parents, so many parents need the kids to be back in school uh, because they need to be at work. And teachers are anxious to get back to school because they know better than anyone that students learn best when they're in a classroom with a strong certified teacher. Um, but I agree um, with Anthony and with Doug that it is a local issue and our school boards are charged with making that decision. Um, I believe that <laughs> They are listening the best that they can. This is a really difficult circumstance because there are so many people who feel so strongly in different ways. But I appreciate that our school board members are listening to stakeholders and to public health experts um, so that they can open as quickly and as safely as possible. Um, I saw on Fox News the other day that the schools in Georgia that opened uh, because everybody wanted to go back to school have had to turn around and close again because the, um, the infection rate spiked. So we don't want to run into that situation where we delay the reopening of school even more by opening too soon. But that is up to our school boards. Um, and I do applaud Arizona leaders for you know, finally coming up with some metrics for some safe reopening. Um, and I just hope that everyone, our legislators and leaders and everyone in our community will help do our part to lower the rate of infection by following the public health expert guidelines to wear a mask in public and try to socially distance and uh, wash your hands frequently because that's the way that we're going to be able to reopen our schools and our businesses and our economy more quickly. Great, and we'll move on to our next question. This is again for all three of you and we'll start this time with Mr. Kern. Will you urge voters in Legislative District 20 to sign up for and vote by mail in the general election? It's a great question. Thank you to the voter that proposed that, and, and uh, thank you, Clean Elections. I, would I urge voters to vote by mail? I, get, I again, think that's a choice by the individual person. I, I am an uh, absentee voter. I get my ballots in the mail and have done so for several years. And I love the, the fact that I can vote in my kitchen, I can fill out the ballot and send it in. 
So I think that's a personal choice by the voter. I know there's a uh, some people that work on my campaign, they go down and vote, and they, that's all they want to do. They do not want to vote by absentee ballot. So would I urge them to vote by mail? That's We've had absentee, absentee balloting for and mail-in voting for years. I think it's pretty well out there that uh, the voter is, is able to do that. In these unprecedented times, I think that it is going to spike. In, in other words, more people are going to sign up for absentee balloting. And I'm going to leave that up to them because I do believe in personal choice and freedom and not being mandated to, to vote by mail. Uh, I think that the, the individual voters should be allowed to, to go to the poll if they are allowed to. Uh, we can go to Walmart and stand six feet apart and, and do the social distancing and and, and, and you know, uh, keep the hygienics going. I just think that's a personal choice as far as voting. There's no reason why we can't do it at the uh, at the ballot booth. And so I, I would prefer to lean on the side of personal freedom. All right, Ms. Schwebert, same question. Well, um, I do think that vote by mail is a good choice. I, it, it certainly is up to the individual as to whether they want to vote by mail or go to uh, the ballot box on election day. But I think it's really unfortunate that there's been a lot of fear mongering about um, that it's not safe to vote by mail when in fact, uh, Arizona has a very secure system. And in fact, 80% of voters, um, as well as our mil military people, um, vote by mail all the time. And it's been secure and an important option for people to have. Um, I, I love voting by mail because I've signed up for the Maricopa County recorders uh, system where they will notify you when your ballot gets mailed and then they'll notify you when they've received it back from you and then when they verified your signature and when um, your signature and when your ballot has been counted. So um, I think it's a great way to go, especially for so many people who are, do have health concerns, um, that's an important way to make sure that we don't have crowding at the polls so that everybody can vote safely. I would um, hate for somebody to just not vote because they think it's not safe. I hope that um, everyone will vote in this very important election. Even if they don't want to uh, mail their ballot, they can drop their ballot off at one of many voting centers around the valley um, that our, um, our county recorder is working hard to make sure we have in place and um, or that where they can go to the polls if they feel safe and they feel strongly that they want to do that. Okay, and Mr. Irvin, same question. Yeah, I mean, we have a, a long tradition here in Arizona of having that option whether it be you're on the Pebble, the permanent earlier voter list, and so you do vote by mail, or if you'd still like to go in and vote in person or do a hybrid there where you drop it off, that's great. Uh, and it's, I think both Anthony and Judy kind of laid out where this is a great option. Unfortunately, the rhetoric we're hearing out there is we're having people who are saying the word only on there when that is not what is anybody is talking about. We're saying expand more mail-in ballots. We're not saying take away vote centers. We're not taking away the option to go in there. And that's one of the things I see at the legislature is this kind of this break between what their rhetoric is of saying, hey, you have this choice and we're all working together. And then their personal actions where they say, no, I'm not going to follow that. That doesn't apply to me and mocking the actual system or the decisions that are made. So that's what I want to make sure is that we have leaders who not only make decisions down at the legislature, but they lead by example. And they're not fear mongering and they're not mocking others. They're actually doing the right thing and setting a good example. Great. And we'll move on to the next question, starting this one with Ms. Schwebert. What will you encourage the legislature to do to address the increasing issue of a lack of affordable housing, especially for low and moderate income people here in Maricopa County? Well, that has become an enormous problem. Um, we have seen rents go up and up um, and, um, be, and housing be less and less affordable, especially for people who are making minimum wage. And um, it used to be that the state legislature funded um, um, a housing program 
that would help people who are on the verge of losing their housing. Um, and now more than ever, as we see so many people falling into unemployment and we see Arizona's unemployment uh, system be so insufficient uh, for people, uh, we need to work harder than ever to make sure that we are addressing the housing situation. I wanna make sure that uh, we are sitting down and listening to stakeholders, the nonprofits uh, who work on behalf of so many people who are on the verge of becoming homeless, um, as well as other groups to help create a strong plan because a lot of this falls under cities' jurisdictions too. So it's up to the legislature to make sure that we are supporting the cities by making sure that they have the resources that they need um, to address this kind of issue. All right, and sticking with the House candidates, Mr. Kern, what would you do to address the lack of affordable housing here? Sure, thank you for the question and, and to the voter who proposed it. Well, the, the biggest thing we can do, I think, for the, the person that finds himself struggling, and again, we are in unprecedented times. I know there's a lot of uh, multiple millions of dollars that are that is out there right now. In fact, today, the uh, governor just announced a, 500, a $540 weekly increase in, in these uh, um, uh, low wage assistance programs, unemployment benefits. So that's actually starting today. So again, we live in unprecedented times, and I think the best way to, to, to address the affordable housing issue is, is job creation. I think the, 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 the state has done a very good job about creating jobs. There's a reason why Californians are moving to Arizona and people from all over the nation are moving to Arizona because we have a very good business climate. And prior to the state shutting down in March, we had uh, a surplus, uh, $1.5 billion in the rainy day fund. We had $750 million plus just in the first few months of this year in revenues from taxes and, and uh, people working. And so we have a very robust economy. And because of legislation that has been put in place by the Republican majority, uh, we, we continue that. So we have kind of saved for the for this type of environment. So there's, there's, so I think jobs is number one. Job creation is number one. You, you allow a person to have that dignity to have a job. Uh, coming from a family of 13, we needed help when I was growing up. We were not rich by any stretch of the imagination. There was a time where my mom and dad had to be on food stamps. My dad drove a truck and uh, he made decent money. But when you feed you know, 13 hung hungry mouths, it, it takes a lot of money. So there was a time where we had to have that assistance, that government assistance, and I understand that completely. And uh, there's been bills proposed at the legislature uh, uh, to provide tax incentives for builders and developers that want to come in and, 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 and create affordable housing. Uh, with the unprecedented move of people moving into the state, Maricopa County was the largest uh, fastest growing county in the nation. I think it still might be, but definitely prior to the lockdown, people were moving here and uh, we needed housing. And right now the, the market is, uh, you know, there's not enough houses on the market. So we, we need to look at the picture holistically. And I think uh, there's tax incentives, there's job creation, and there's all kinds of things we can do as a legislature uh, to, to, to address this problem. And uh, so I think as, as Arizona continues to grow and our economy continues to boom, uh, I, think, uh, I think that will address it uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a great way. Thank you. Okay. Like, may yeah, I, go ahead. Okay, may I respond? Um, okay, so um, Anthony mentioned something about the announcement today of the $540 a week increase in unemployment. Um, I wanna clarify that. Um, and back up a little bit. Arizona has the second lowest unemployment um, insurance benefit in the nation, and um, it's $240 a week. And uh, in these unprecedented times, yes, we have you know hundreds of thousands of people who, at least at this point, need some assistance, and it's completely inadequate. Um, you know, we can look at numbers, but. I'm, I'm hearing from constituents 
all the time about this. One woman contacted me the other day and said, I have been in the travel industry for 40 years and my industry has imploded. There are no jobs. I'm going to need to look elsewhere. Um, and $240 a week is sh a shameful amount for people to be receiving because um, number one, I'm a breast cancer survivor, she told me. And so I have to have insurance. So COBRA will cost me $500 a month. And that leaves me $460 a month to pay my mortgage and my utilities and buy groceries and my, make my car payment. Um, will you work on making sure that we can fix this? And this is something that our legislature, including Anthony, has had the opportunity to fix over and over again and have declined to do so. Uh, the Grand Canyon Institute has suggested some um, changes, some practical changes to that program, um, and I would like to see us implement those. Uh, the $540 amount that Anthony mentioned is actually um, includes a $300 a week federal subsidy, which is fine for the interim, but that will run out. And we need to make sure that we are updating our antiquated, completely inadequate um, unemployment program um, to sustain people. Because as we have seen, one last point here, <laughs> um, during this pandemic, it's ordinary citizens like you and me who are the ones who are driving this economy. When we have money in our pockets to spend, um, that's what creates jobs. We are the job creators. And so um, that $600 temporary CARES Act federal money, I've been told, um, has actually helped um, us not fall into a deeper hole than we have already. Um, so I think it's important that we make sure that people do have money in their pockets, not just to help them out, but because we all do better when people have money to spend. And that's also, by the way, why we should invest in education. And can I respond? Of course. Thank you. Uh, some good points brought up by Judy Sweeper, and I appreciate them. And I just want to comment, we all can do better when people have money in their pockets, absolutely. But I want to say that, again, job creation is the number one way for people to actually have money in, in, in their pockets. And Judy's right, the $200, uh, $240 uh, and $40 unemployment insurance has been around for a while. And uh, prior to this shutdown, uh, you know, a lot of people... I don't know what the numbers were specifically, but they the, the ones that were on $240 a week, that that helped, but it didn't it didn't help so much to keep them from going to get a job. What I'm saying is that we do not want the 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 cure to be worse than the the actual disease itself or the actual uh, pandemic itself. So the federal government is pouring in another $300. It's a grant of money that we are putting in to up everybody's unemployment insurance to $540 a week. If you've already applied for unemployment insurance, that you do not need to reapply. It's going to come automatically. And I also have been working with people actually outside my district also that have, have told me that they are struggling. When it went back to $240 a week, that they were struggling in this. But prior to the pandemic, they had a job. They didn't need unemployment insurance. So right now, I think we do need to, uh, to, to address the unemployment insurance issue. We don't want to, 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 again, make the cure worse than the cause in that we do not want people to stay on unemployment. We do want people to go out and get a job once the economy kicks back in. So I, I agree that it, it can be looked at could have I fixed it? I'm one vote down at the Capitol. Uh, there's there's 59 other votes. And so, you know, I'm definitely open to the debate and open to the discussion about raising unemployment insurance. But my philosophy is job creation. Uh, there's dignity in work. And when a person's able to work, they have that dignity to better their lives, to buy a home, to put money in the bank. And if we can create that through the legislature, uh, then I think that's what we should do and get people actually off unemployment. Right now, unprecedented times, you know, all of us are kind of, you know, looking to, to where this is all going to lead. 
but uh, but definitely the five hundred and forty dollars a week is going to help, and uh, I'm definitely open for discussion in uh, in the unemployment uh, debate when the legislature opens again in January. Thank you. May I say one more thing? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so when the legislature passed the skinny budget back in March as we were entering into this pandemic, I know that Anthony was one of the people who voted no on amendments that would have helped bolster our unemployment system. So I, I, I don't know why he uh, would vote no on something like that as we're heading into these unprecedented times. Um, the other thing is that the best way to create jobs is to make sure that we are educating people, uh, whether that is in uh, traditional K-12 education, whether it's in community colleges, or whether it's uh, in trade schools. My dad um, became the first principal of the first area vocational center in the Valley, and he drilled into me the importance of um, the trades um, and how critical it is that we have plumbers and electricians and welders and, um, and other people. And um, yet our legislature, uh, and uh, Anthony has, has, has voted against, let me back up, our legislature has inadequately funded education um, and as a matter of fact has zeroed out community college funding, which is one of or had been one of the most important ways for students to be able to go to college and for students to be able to, or for adults to be able to retrain for other jobs. So um, I'm very disappointed that our legislature has done so poorly by our students. And I wanna make sure that every student gets the quality education that they deserve. And that means we need to fund our schools. And can I respond? Okay. We'll get to Doug. We'll get to Doug eventually. Yeah, go, go so ahead. I, thank you, thank you. I'd like to respond to my no vote on the floor. So we have said over and over that this is unprecedented times we're living in. None of us have ever lived through a pandemic before. None of us has ever seen the nation and the state shut down. None of us have ever seen businesses closed. And, and the climate of fear that has been put upon the entire nation uh, and Arizona since March. And so because of those unprecedented times, uh, if I remember correctly, it was about a $10 million uh, allotment of, of, grant, of, of, of state monies to the unemployment insurance fund. And the reason why my no vote was there was because we did not know what kind of money we would need for testing or masks or medical or nurses and doctors, and we did not know what we were facing at the time. So that that explains my no vote. We all want people to survive. None of us, a Democrat or Republican, want people to be hurting out there during these times. And my heart goes out to everybody in the district. Uh, you can get a hold of me, and you know uh, my, my website is votekern.com. We all agree on quality education, absolutely. And since I've been at the legislature, I have voted for the 20% teacher pay increase. I have voted to put more money into education. I don't have the figures in front of me, but I know it's been in the hundreds of millions of dollars in the six years that I've been there. And so to say that we have not funded education, I think is, 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 is a misnomer. In fact, the last figures I, I think I, it was, it was about 15,000 per student in our public education system. I, 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 support, uh, I support our public education. I support education. I support good quality education for our students. They are our future. And so without good quality education, you know, we're going to go, it, it, it's going to go south. So to say that, that, you know, that that's just kind of a Democrat issue, I think is wrong. Uh, you can look at my votes in the, in the education uh, uh, funding component and see that I voted yes. Now, was there debate? Was there, is there different, different philosophical ideas about where the money goes or, or about uh, you know holding school boards accountable for where the money goes. Yeah, there's that debate. But I think the figures show that Arizona has three of the top public schools in the nation. So, and it, depending upon the district that you're talking about, some of our public schools are, do, are using their money very well. And that doesn't mean that the other ones are not, 
In fact, I was working with our Washington Elementary School District. I was working with with some of the people down at the Capitol, Mr. Stanton in, in particular, the superintendent of, of Washington Elementary School District. And we were gonna put about, if I remember correctly, don't quote me on these numbers, but it was about 80 plus million dollars into, uh, 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 into the Washington Elementary School District because it is a, um, and I don't know about the entire amount, but it was gonna be, it was gonna be uh, channeled into different school districts where the poverty rate had, had, had had went down to a certain level. So, so I've been involved in the education de debate and discussion. And to say that I haven't done that is, is just incorrect. Look at my voting record, go to azleg.gov and see and, and contact me. I'm open, my door's always open. Whether we agree or disagree, my door's open. Thank you. All right, now we're going, do you want to say something? I just want to say I have much, much more to say about education, but I want to give Doug a chance to respond to this question first. <laughs> All right. Yes, yeah, so and let's move on to you, Mr. Irvin. Our original question was about, is that affordable housing originally? <laughs> I think it was affordable housing. <laughs> right. But the price so has gone up since then. So, um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, this is where I want to bring my business experience and my accounting background to the legislature. Because if we just stuck with affordable count, uh, housing for a minute, remember that we need to be working with our cities at the legislature. But unfortunately, we keep giving unproductive tax breaks away to special interest groups. And that not only drains money from the general fund of the state, but when you give sales tax exemptions away, that hurts the city budget. So then they can't invest in much in affordable housing. Now, I grew up in a military family, and veterans are exceedingly important to me. So I've gone along and I've talked to folks out there that are homeless right now. And unfortunately, too many of them are veterans and they feel completely shut out and forgotten about in this state. And then they say, hey, you know, I want to do things. I want to help out. We say, yes, you can, but we need to bring them in and hire them and pay them well also as government employees, because that's a good thing. But when you're an accountant, the way you grow a business, the way you create jobs, is not slashing like was done in 2008. It's not holding back, it's by investing. So when you invest in education, you're hiring teachers, they're investing and spending their money here in Arizona. So that's what we need to be doing. And then the worst part is, as I was out talking, I've talked to thousands and thousands of people across our district. And even before the pandemic, one of the questions I would get often is, they keep telling me the economy's great. So what's going on with Metro Center? Why is Bell Tower Pavilion doing this? Why is this? Why aren't we getting the jobs and the creation here in LD20? Why are our reps and our senators that we elected not helping us here in LD20? I agree with them. I can say, hey, look, earlier this year, my opponent, he co-sponsored a bill that gave $10 million property tax breaks to utilities and golf courses. And then on the same bill was imposing new fees on family vehicles. Is that fiscally responsible? No. Does that help our economy grow? No. Does that help LD20? Absolutely not. So that's the stuff I wanna bring. I wanna bring that idea that we're actually helping our neighbors and our community and being that fiscal responsibility so we invest here. That's gonna create the jobs. That's gonna help the housing situation. That's gonna help us work with the city in a bipartisan way so we're helping our community. So that's what we really need. All right, this is a question directly for Representative Kern from a voter who writes that they are a constituent who has been unable to reach you and has also been blocked from viewing or commenting on your official Facebook page. Um, this voter writes that you recently advocated for a bill that would force universities to monitor speakers and provide multiple viewpoints, but you have blocked several constituents, themselves included, from your official Facebook page. Do you consider that position hypocritical? And how can constituents trust you to represent them when you aren't listening to, to them, the voter rights? Thank you, great question from the voter that I apparently blocked from my Twitter feed. Uh, so the bill that I wanted to uh, push through the House, and I think it passed out of the House and was going into the Senate, was actually going to bring a more diverse culture into our universities. So what it created, was a diversity office and it modeled, uh, I had a gentleman named Stanley Kurtz who would help me 
uh, craft the bill, and we had worked with the education committee uh, on 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 the, the the dynamics of what the bill did. So the bill actually brought in every point of view. Anytime there was a debate on campus, every point of view would be presented. And I think if you're going to educate our students, they they cannot just have a one-sided view, uh, which as you see in a lot of our universities are, you know, the social justice programs and, and even what you see in our nation's uh, cities right now, the mayhem and the tearing down of the statues. And, and a lot of that can be traced back to universities teaching a one-sided uh, fit one-sided uh, viewpoint. So my goal was to teach all sides. I don't want to get rid of the social justice programs in the universities. I want to bring every viewpoint, the constitutional programs into our universities and every other viewpoint. ASU, there's a there's a, a, a school. It's called the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership in Arizona State University. And there's one down at the University of Arizona. And if you've ever and I would ask this voter to follow me to one of their debates, and they will see what actually happens when both viewpoints are presented. So if we're going to educate students to, to go out into the real world, they cannot just have a one-sided one viewpoint. They've got to have it all, then let them make the decision on what they believe, what they don't believe. But to indoctrinate our kids uh, in the universities, in my opinion, is just wrong. And that's why we see what we see out in our cities, the mayhem, the tearing down of the statues, the burning buildings. It's it's kind of a hate America type group. And so that, that can be started or that can be fixed in our universities. So that's what my bill does. As far as removing this person from Twitter and my Facebook page, I would ask that person to reach out to me, sit down one-on-one, -on -one, come to my office down at the Capitol, let's talk. We all know Twitter is a fake universe. One person can have hundreds of thousands of accounts and they can say whatever they want because they're not, they're not facing anybody. It's amazing what we can accomplish when we sit down and talk face to face. I have talked with, with the, the superintendent of Thunderbird High School in that area. And I, I, I think he was a superintendent. Anyway, one day him and I, he is, he is left and I'm right and politically. And we were walking down the hall one day couple of years ago, and I looked at him and I said, there's a lot that we agree upon. And it's amazing what we can accomplish if we just sit down. And as I think Doug said, you know, the party politics, and we sit down as human beings, and we discuss what's best for our state, what's best for our children, what's best for our universities. And I think we can all agree that, uh, that you know, what's best is, is what's best and get everybody's input and then make a decision. But because we're so divisive uh, and Twitter is, is just a platform where it's very divisive, uh, it's probably why if this person uh, was, was deleted from or blocked from my Twitter feed, it's probably why. Because, you know, to attack and to say all kinds of nasty things, I don't deserve that. Judy doesn't deserve that. Doug doesn't deserve, deserve that. You don't deserve that. So when they're willing to come, give me a call, talk face to face. I'd be more than happy to sit down. May I, say, may I make a comment? Yes, of course. Okay, thank you. So um, the bill that Anthony is talking about really um, would have made the government police every single speaker who ever came to ASU or U of A, which is kind of crazy. It seems like government, that seems like government overreach to me. And, you know, um, any conservative student um, or person who wants to present a viewpoint at a university is absolutely free to do that. So I think it's really a false narrative to say all universities make sure that they only teach uh, liberal, liberal history or liberal social justice. Um, there are many viewpoints on our college campuses, and I think it's a disservice not only to our college campuses, but to the intelligence of all of us um, in our district to, to suggest that they do not. Um, Can I comment? I believe Ms. Schwebert was still, let her finish Judy, her sentence. Judy, sorry, about that. sorry about that. 
Okay. Um, also, I know that the freedom schools that Anthony speak of, speaks about at uh, ASU and U of A um, are receiving quite a bit of funding from our legislature, even despite the fact that they've cut enormous amounts of other funding from the general um, the general fund of our universities um, that has resulted in a lot of the increases in tuition. So um, unfortunately, I think that, that the shoe is actually on the other foot, that there's more of a, uh, a bias in the other direction of funding our universities unfairly in the direction of one viewpoint than all other viewpoints that might want to be represented or heard about or discussed on a campus. Yeah, do you mind if I speak here, take my turn? Because I just want to make sure we're pointing out something here. As the discussion goes on, you're going to hear rhetoric. Oh, we're working together. We can solve these things together. This is great. Different points of view. But then you watch the reality of the legislature. Oh, that bill's got a D on it. We're not going to do that. We're not going to hear that in our committee. Oh, it's budget time. Well, then we're just going to take the majority party and get the majority of the majority to agree on the budget. And then we're going to come out and say, here it is. We're going to start voting on this in a day or two. And any amendments you have, we're not going to listen to. Is that working together? No. Is that bipartisan? No. That's the stuff I honestly, truly want to do. I've said that, look, if I was the chair of a committee, everyone on that committee gets to at least have one bill heard because they should have good ideas. But that's not the reality down there. We hear lip service from all the time that, oh, we're working together. This is how we're doing it. Look at the reality. It's time that people step up and really walk the walk of what they're saying. So I appreciate that Anthony is saying, hey, we're going to work together. We'll sit there and do these things together. We're not going to throw jobs by party. And I hear my opponent say the same thing. But this is what we need is people who are really going to do it now, not just pay lip service and get in office and then go right back to the old ways of it's my party or no way. Can I comment? Yes. There's so much to comment on. Thank you, Doug and Judy, for those comments. I just want to say a couple things. So when Doug was talking, I, I thought to myself, how many times have I reached across the aisle and actually worked with some of the Democrat legislators? And I, one came to my mind in particular. He's a very good Democrat uh, representative. He ran a bill that actually upped the, 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 the uh, uh, um, charges for an assault on a nurse uh, working at a hospital. So his bill was to protect nurses when they were when they were helping a patient, if the patient assaulted that nurse, if I remember correctly, the violations went up. I think it went into the felony status. I forget which felony, so don't quote me on it. That representative could not get the votes from the Democrat Party. And that representative came to my office because it was in rules. And I wanted to talk to him about this particular bill because I thought it was a good idea. and. I said, I asked him, I said, do you have the votes for the bill? If I move it out of rules, do you have the votes? He said, my Democrat caucus will not vote for it. So I'm going to have to rely on the Republican caucus to do that. And I said, look, it's a good bill. Let's get it on the floor. When it went to the floor, that bill passed a common sense bill about protecting nurses and healthcare workers from, from being assaulted in the hospitals. That bill was passed by a Republican majority. So to say we never work across the aisle is just false information. There have been other times where the Democrats, I remember one other particular time, there was a Democrat member, she was a freshman. She wanted to vote on a Republican bill because it was a good idea. The, re the Democrat leadership went over to her table and we had to wait on, on the final vote on that bill. They went over to her table and made her cry because they said, you do not vote for this because you will not be reelected. And that is a true story. I could tell you the member's name. Uh, so there is many opportunities where we work together. Uh, the Speaker of the House has allowed many Democrat bills through, and uh, we've talked about them. I've had many Democrats in my office 
some of them have leaned, you know, very far left. And, and they sat down in front of my desk and said, I really would like this bill. And if it's a common sense bill, absolutely, I'll work across the aisle. Now, I don't support what Democrats support. That's infanticide. I don't support taking away your Second Amendment rights. I don't support stifling free speech. So I support other things. So if that, if a bill to say infanticide came to my desk, I would stop that bill, absolutely, because I don't believe in, in killing unborn babies or even born babies. So there's it, it depends upon what the issue is. And if the issue is a common sense approach to helping Arizona citizens, absolutely. You know, so I'll just leave that at, at that. And I want to say that there are a lot of good Democrats at the Capitol. There's a lot of good Republicans at the Capitol. In both parties, there's people on, on very opposite ends. Okay, we get that, but uh, but there's a lot of room for improvement, and I think that uh, working across the aisle is something that I've that I've been very proud of. Thank you. Um, since Anthony brought up the rules committee, I'd like to make a couple of points about that. Um, uh, First of all, I'm going to back up because um, we were talking about the fact that he wasn't responding to this voter who posed the question and had blocked them from their Twitter feed. Um, a big part of the reason that I'm even running for office is that I tried to contact Anthony uh, when, when I was his constituent uh, to to talk to him about an education bill um, I really that I really wanted him to take a stand on at the time. And... Um, he just could never seem to manage to find any time to talk with me or correspond with me about that. And so a big part of why I am running for office is that I found that my representatives were not listening to me. And I was hearing that from other people in our district too, that they were not listening. And unfortunately, as chair of the rules committee in the state house, Anthony has built up quite a reputation among both Democrats and Republicans for obstructing bills that would be good bills to be considered, bills that had made it out of committee and were scheduled to go to the floor. But the Rules Committee first has to determine that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed before it goes to the floor. But instead of just checking those technicalities, Anthony has frequently taken it upon himself to just say, well, I don't agree with that. I'm not going to let that bill go for even discussion on the floor of the state house. One was a pre-K education bill that would have given $7 million for at-risk pre-K education. Um, I mean, who doesn't want to make sure that our youngest children who are at risk have an opportunity to thrive? Um, and I could name, I could go on and on with the number of bills that he has obstructed. Um, another one was a bill um, for changing tables, for adult changing tables last session, that a grassroots group of parents who have adult children um, who they can't take out because there's no dignified place to take care of their needs. And Anthony um, uh, would not allow that bill to even be heard on the floor. Eventually, a way was found around that. and. Um, it was passed with both Republican and Democratic support. So it's very nice to hear Anthony talk about wanting to work in a bipartisan way, but that has not been his history. And that's a big part of why I'm even running for office. I've, I'm retired. I have grandkids. I never imagined that I would be running for office, as I mentioned in my opening. But um, our district and our state needs people who really are truly going to work in a bipartisan way and a multi-partisan way to get things done. And as Doug said, really walk the walk instead of just talking about that. And can I respond? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, for bringing up some, some great points. So uh, to say that I was uh, not working across the aisle, you had, you had said that I had stopped Democrat bills, which I did. And I had stopped Republican bills, which I did. So to me, that's kind of bipartisan. I didn't just let uh, uh, I didn't just let Republican bills go through and they stop all the Democrat bills. And as I said earlier, I, there have been many Democrats in my office, some very far far left leaning, that have asked and talked about certain bills that they wanted to see through. And 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 there's a reason why I'm the rules chair. And as you mentioned, Judy, 
there are other ways to get a bill across the finish line. Our founding fathers wanted to make it very difficult for any legislation to pass because our founding fathers believed that government was not the answer, that government is really the problem. And we are, we are the gov we are the one, we are the kings and queens. We are the ones who tell the legislature what to do. So the, my door has always been open with Democrats and Republicans. And as rules chair, there was the reason why I was given that, that position. And that is to look at these bills carefully, get with the sponsor, talk with them about what's their reasoning uh, on, on the bill, who's behind the bill, that's important. And, uh, and you had mentioned a couple of them. So I'll just kind of comment on the adult changing table. That bill as first written would have hurt small business because it would have mandated that changing tables be that that small businesses be be mandated to to change the, the the dynamics of their restrooms and allow for adult changing tables. So that was a mandate on small business. And did it cross the finish line? Yes, it did cross the finish line. And I know who the sponsor was, and the sponsor had come to me several times. I had talked to constituents about it. I understood their concerns, and my heart went out to them. But again, in protecting small business, I had to ensure that government, the big hand of government, wasn't going to come down on a small business and mandate an, uh, uh, another recommendation so or another mandate. So anyway, uh, you had mentioned the K-12 uh, at-risk children. I'd like to know more about that bill, and if uh, I'll look it up and see exactly what happened on that bill. But I know that there was a big push down at the Capitol from the Democrat Party to to begin to teach young children about sex education and to begin to teach young children about, about the transgender and, 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 and all those social issues. And uh, I just could not see that being done to our small children. I think there's a time and place for that. And I believe in sex education, absolutely, but not to our youngest uh, uh, students. And, and that's, if I remember that bill correctly, that's what that did. And, uh, to the voters out there, I can show you the book. It's called "It's Perfectly Normal." That book is is a is a pornographic book being taught to our youngest children. Uh, in some, of, it's being pushed by the Democrat Party in some states, and it's going to be pushed here in our state. So that's that's I think what that bill was doing. And I just wanted to make voters aware out there. If you want to see that book, I I not really I have not really. I opened it up. I glanced at it. That was enough for me. And and to have that book being taught into our into our into our education system, uh, I think is appalling. And I think parents need to be aware of that. Uh, and that's that's uh, that's just talking about that particular bill. So uh, I'm all for helping at-risk children. And to say that I would stop a bill that would literally help at-risk children is wrong. Because uh, I am a I'm a proud church member. I go to a church in Peoria. And uh, we, I'm opening a transition home to help people that are, are, are hooked on drugs and, and need help, uh, at-risk children, absolutely. My dream would be to open up an orphanage and help kids that need, that need it. So uh, to say that I stopped an at-risk bill, I think is wrong. It's just uh, giving out the wrong, uh, the wrong information. And uh, again, would love to talk to anybody out there that's listening to this video. Well, my door's always open. Let's talk about the bill. And uh, maybe we can tweak and get it, get it, get it in the, in the next session. Thank you. There were a lot of distortions and red herrings in that answer. Um, one of the things that I would just like to clarify is the bill I'm talking about was a seven million dollar. Um, bill for at-risk pre-K education that he blocked in rules, first of all, that had nothing to do with sex education. Um, the other thing that I just want to point out is that when we are truly interested in making sure that we work across the aisle in a bipartisan and multi-partisan way, we don't throw grenades at the other side uh, like Democrats want to, you know, show pornographic material to our children. That's a, a ridiculous statement. Um, I think we all want to make sure that our children are safe and that um, they have a good education. And we ha may differ on some points, but uh, to paint Democrats as somebody who want to prey on children um, and show them pornography is 
a classic example of throwing a grenade rather than having respect for one another's viewpoints. Um, so I, I will just leave it at that. I, I know. Can I, can I comment on that? Let's move on to the next question, which is also for you. And then okay. if you want to add something to the end, we can sure. do that. Okay. So this next question, we, I've gotten a few versions of this from voters who have commented on some of some of the behavior you've exhibited on social media is posting photos of yourself at voter outreach events without wearing a mask, a certain photo that went viral in March of a handful of lawmakers standing under a clock at a restaurant asking where Mayor Kate Gallego was after her order telling restaurants to shut for dine-in services went into effect. Do you have a responsibility as a lawmaker to model types of responsible behavior like wearing a mask or abiding shutdown orders to encourage your constituents to do the same? And thank you for that question and, and, uh, and to the voter who presented it. I absolutely feel as a leader, I have a responsibility. And that responsibility is to wear a mask, uh, to, to respect small businesses, to respect people when I approach their homes, when I'm out. Uh, gathering votes for my campaign. Uh, in these pictures that that I've posted on social media, uh, most of them, uh, they have a choice to wear the mask or not wear the mask. And so again, I lean on the side of personal choice and personal responsibility. Uh, I, think, I think there's a lot of good that has come out of this shutdown, this pandemic, and that is this, the distancing, that is the washing of the hands, which we should have been done already. That is, uh, that is when you go to a supermarket, as soon as you're done with the, uh, the credit card machine, they wipe it down for the next customer. I mean, there's a lot of good that's come out, but there is one party that, that you know, there's a lot of fear out there. And there is one party, I think, that, that wants to continue that fear of, of the pandemic, whereas the other party, and that would be the Democrats, and the whereas the other party just believes in personal responsibility, personal choice. And so when we take those group photos, we have masks in our pocket. And we, and some of us choose to wear a mask and some of us don't choose to wear a mask. So to mandate that we wear a mask, I think is wrong. I do think that we should all be, be, be clean and be, you know, be cognizant of the fact that there's somebody sitting next to you, a uh, elderly person in your church that, you know, that might be afraid of, uh, or, or that I visit at a door. But I, I think that to mandate masks is wrong. Again, that's government telling us what to do. And I believe in, in, in less government. And so, but I also believe in personal choice. I believe in people's respect. Uh, I think Judy had mentioned about respecting people. Absolutely, I respect people. And that's why I wear a mask when I'm knocking on doors. I posted that on social media. I posted where, where my team is wearing masks. So, so to single out just the photos where, I, where we as a group, you know, some of us were not wearing masks, I think is, is incorrect. And, and, uh, and I, support, I support personal choice. And thank you. So do, so do you regret that posting that photo uh, with other Republican lawmakers back in March, kind of making fun of the uh, guidelines that had been um, put in place as a result of public health experts' advice? Thank you. Can I comment? Yes. Thank you so much. So do I, do I, what was the question? I'm sorry, Judy. Do you regret posting that photo, okay. making fun of kind of flaunting uh, the rules that had been put in place um, based on the advice of public health experts? Do I regret it? No, I absolutely do not. And here's why. Uh, that photo, the only reason I took it down for the record was because another member had asked me to do it, not because I was, I was afraid of the, of the repercussions. Uh, Mayor Kate Gallego has taken... Uh, uh, kind of a, a charge on mandating everyone wear a mask and mandating businesses close their doors. And, you know, you had mentioned earlier about the unemployment insurance. Well, I think, again, that the voters are smart enough to understand the pandemic. They are smart enough to understand whether or not their business should be shut down. They are smart enough to wear a mask. They are smart enough to wash their hands. So to have a mayor of a city 
mandate that everybody shut down, the businesses shut down, which is going to hurt people. It's going to it's going to have people lose their mortgages. It's going to it's going to not put money in people's pockets as you had mentioned earlier. Uh, so what what we did at that time and in that restaurant is we were mocking the mayor, I guess, and because I disagreed with her her uh, her decree in that every business, every every restaurant, every business needs to shut down at such a, a particular time. Business owners are smart people. Just because a person's in an elected office doesn't make them, you know, uh, the, the ruler over many. Uh, we, are the, we are the servants. We should be serving these business people and the constituents in our district. So for me to, to, to have the authority to mandate without any, any input from any businesses I think is absolutely wrong, uh, and and I think the businesses should be able to choose on what their CDC precautions uh, are, and they that most of them are following the CDC guidelines. Most of them are following the six six foot distancing. Most of them are requiring masks when I when they when a person walks into the restaurant. So why would a mayor shut down the entire city? Let the business uh, choose on how they want to follow these CDC guidelines, and then let me as a patron decide on whether or not. What they're doing is going to going to protect me or not protect me. It's all about choice. It's not about government ruling over the people. And I know that's what the Democrat Party stands for: is government ruling over people. So here's another grenade, Judy: <laughs> the government ruling over people. Now, not every Democrat, because like I said, there's there's Democrats at the Capitol that I work with. But the party as a platform, you can see it in the national politics. You can see it in this election. You can see it in LD20. And so I think that personal choice, that the voters are smart enough to make their own decisions on whether or not they should patronize a business that has opened and following the CDC guidelines. It's funny. You look across the name. Thank God we have Governor Ducey because you look at California. California, it's a crime to go to church. It's a crime to have a Bible study in California. Who runs California? The Democrats. So thank God Governor Ducey hasn't, hasn't done that, and we are still allowed by the Constitution to attend worship service. But, you know, you have these protests at the Capitol. No one says anything about those and about their mask mandates and their washing. Has anybody asked any of them, where's your mask? Why aren't you washing your hands? Uh, no, they haven't. But, uh, but to focus on businesses, on mom-and-pop shops that are trying to make a living I think was wrong. And so I do not regret that photo. And I kind of wish I wouldn't have taken it down, to be honest with you. Thank you. Well, it's interesting for you to talk about supporting mom and pop shops when um, you, you and uh, your majority have voted consistently uh, to give tax incentives to big out-of-state businesses rather than focusing on our local small business owners. Um, I would like to see uh, that we are instead focusing on places like Metro Center and places like Belltown Pavilion and other places that are going under from local, because local businesses have not had the support that they need. Um, they are truly the fabric of our communities and they are the ones that should be getting support. And I believe that the way that we can support them, one important way, in addition to making sure that we're buying from local businesses um, and buying gift cards from local businesses to help support them right Right now is also to make sure that we are following the public health experts guidelines so that we can reopen as quickly as possible because we are prolonging the pain when we are um, when we are flaunting the rules and saying well it doesn't apply to me or this is government overreach it's not government overreach it's people watching out for one another so that we can go back to school so that we can uh, reopen our small businesses so that we can re open our economy. There have been key times in our history. I think about World War II and in Britain when the planes were flying overhead. Everybody in Britain had blackout curtains and blacked out the windows at night so that the enemy, by, enemy planes could not see where the towns were. And when people didn't follow those guidelines and rules, they endangered their whole 
town and even their whole country. So there are times when it's not just about me, but it's about us. And sometimes that requires a little bit of personal sacrifice. Um, but I think the way that we're really going to be supporting our local small business people is to follow the rules so that we can get to the other side of that. I had a local business owner tell me that just last week. I wish people would just wear their masks and stay home and wash their hands because that's how we're going to get to the other side of this instead of rowing in circles. We need to be rowing in the same direction. Can I comment real quick? Yes, one last time. Th thank you, thank you. So follow the rules. According to who? When you say follow the rules, we need to follow. Well, hold on, I'm not done. Hold on, I'm not done. When you say follow the rules, it's according to a Democrat mayor. It's according to you know the Democrat Party. I don't know what that means. Follow the rules. What what that means? What that means to me when I say follow the rules? The rules are the United States Constitution. The rules are the Arizona Constitution, which gives us freedom and liberty to choose. And, and if a person is smart enough to operate a business with all the accounting and with all the revenue coming, you know, coming and going, with all the forms that they have to fill out, with all the licensing they have to do, uh, whether it be state or federal, when they're smart enough to do that and a pandemic hits, I think they're smart enough to follow the CDC guidelines and ensure that their patrons are safe. The restaurants that I, that I walk, every one I've, I've walked into, they, they 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 have this the, the guidelines in place the mask wearing the hand washing the sanitizers so why would we say when they follow the rules is it rules according to democrat mayor kate gallego uh you know i i again i thank god that uh, that 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 our governor ducey has you know he's 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 in a hard place he's looking at all different numbers he's seeing things that i don't see and he's had to make some tough choices, and I'm sure he's not even wanted to make. Uh, but I just want to say, when you say follow the rules, I say, yeah, follow the rules by the United States and the Arizona Constitution and allow personal choice to, to be the, the, the star of the day. Let people choose and follow the CD, CDC guidelines on what they, what, what, what they want to do. Um, so that being said, I, I want to thank you know, the voters, I think we're about done. It is 710 and, and I have to get going to a meeting, but I just want to, well, I'll give it back to Julie. I, I apologize. <clears throat> okay. Yes. And we are running a little over time. I think Ms. Schwieber, it looked like you wanted to respond to that. Say something about the rules. If you want to get in that last answer, then we'll move on to closing statements. Okay, what I would like to say is um, I made a, may have made a poor choice of words by saying following the rules. What my intention was, was to say that we need to follow the advice of experts and what experts are saying. And uh, what the experts are saying is to social distance and wear a mask because that's how we are going to stop this pandemic. You know, if I have an electrical emergency in my house, I call an electrician. And if I have a public health emergency, I'm gonna look to the public health expert to help us solve that. So um, that is that is what I am trying, that's the point that I am trying to make. All right, getting on to closing statements, we'll again start with our one Senate candidate here, Mr. Irvin. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry my opponent couldn't show up. Uh, I understand he has a class tonight, which I prefer he was out talking to voters and answering questions and uh, being part of the democratic process, which debates are very important in. But you can see the choice is clear. Uh, my opponent's a career politician, and he's focused on his personal ambitions. I'm a retired accountant, and my focus is helping the people in our community. I mean, I'm really honored that I've earned the support of doctors, nurses, students, teachers, veterans, retirees, labor groups, and lots of small businesses. And that's because they know I'm going to use my decades of experience in business where I solve problems. And that's what we're trying to do with the problems that the state currently faces. And I'm going to continue to listen to Mr. I'm going to continue to work and buy and implement business responsible solutions to help Arizona families to thrive. 
but I couldn't sit idly by anymore when a bunch of self-serving politicians were out there with rhetoric, just trying to do that. They're trying to disrespect people. I see it. I don't know if that's their intention, but it's clear that's what they're doing. They've defunded our schools. Definitely from 2008, you can see that going forward. And we are not where we're supposed to be. And they're jeopardizing our future by giving away unproductive tax breaks. I mean, clearly the way we fix these problems is we change the people who are in office. So I hope folks will visit my website, irvinforarizona.com, to learn more about my plans and to contact me. And I really look forward to hearing from you. I look forward to earning your vote. And I really look forward to serving you in the state Senate. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Kern, your closing statement. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be on this clean elections debate. And uh, I look forward to a, a, a good uh, campaign uh, in the next few months. And I would ask voters to get out and vote. I would ask voters to check my website out, www.votekern.com. As Doug said, the, there, there's, there's definitely clear defining philosophies that you will be voting on. You will be voting, uh, you know, uh, on, on, on um, abortion-related, pro-life, abortion versus pro-life. You'll be voting on defunding police or supporting the police. You'll be voting on illegal immigration or immigration. You'll be voting on anti-Second Amendment or pro-Second Amendment. You'll be voting on neighbor, uh, neighborhood security or not neighborhood security. Uh, it, it's very clear on where the issues uh, are and who believes what. And, and at, during the campaign, a lot of people just kind of say what, what, what the voters want to hear. And I don't know if that's been done here or not. I'm not going to throw that grenade. But I do want to say that my track record and my experience my voting track record and my experience as a small business owner, as a law enforcement officer, uh, really says a lot in where I stand on, on the issues. Uh, I, my door is always open. I know, I know it, has, it has been mentioned that some people had not been able to get a hold of me. Well, I apologize for that. Uh, I've had people, uh, I, I'm sure Judy and both da Judy and David are no Rivko Knox. Rivko Knox has sat in my office and we've talked. We've talked out at the Capitol. We sat and had lunch together at an event down at the Capitol. I'm I'm open to discussion and you know, I'm open to the debate. I'm open to listening to the views. I'm afraid that because we are so polarized, there's a lot of uh, 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 of things that uh, that just we 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 stop and we're not able to work together. I do think there's an appetite to work together. I know there isn't in me, and I hope there is in these other candidates. Uh, but, you know, visit my website, www.votekern.com. Uh, I'm experienced. I, I, I'm not a career politician. I absolutely didn't think about running six years ago, and I was in a five-way race, and uh, I won, and, and here I am. But I think I do support the people of uh, the representatives of LD20. I absolutely would look forward to uh, to revamping Metro Center, as was discussed, and uh, uh, that recently just fell down for the voters that did not. So um, I, I am open to discussion. Look forward to robust campaign as we move forward. It's important to get out and vote. It's taken. It's whether Arizona Center or Arizona's blue, and uh, to the voters that want to stay real. Thank you. Great, right, and last but certainly not least, Ms. Schwebert. Thank you so much, Julie, and thank you. to Anthony and Doug, and special thank you to everybody who is watching this. Um, this is such an important uh, part of this election, is having an open debate. Um, as somebody who has spent my life in this district as a teacher and a mom and a community leader and a volunteer, um, like I said, I never imagined I would run for office, but I was prompted to because Arizona continues to fail our students. We are in the midst of an education crisis. Last year, we had 1,800 classrooms of children who had no 
permanent qualified teacher. And now with the pandemic, we have a lot of people who are looking at retirement or quitting and we're gonna, that, that number of empty classrooms has the potential to grow exponentially. We need to be serious about investing in our schools, in our kids, and in our economy, because we know that the best way to put money in people's pockets is to educate them so that they can go out and get jobs and help be job creators. We, everyday Arizonans, are the ones who are the job creators. The people who are representing us now have not invested in us. They have put special interests out of state corporations ahead of us, giving them tax credits and tax breaks when we have not had those same things. Uh, we need to invest in our kids. We need to make sure our health care is uh, protected. Um, my opponent has allowed junk health insurance to pass that will trick people and uh, where it allows insurance companies to take advantage of people. And at this time, when we're recovering from a pandemic, it's more important than ever that we are listening and working together rather than working at cross purposes, rather than throwing these grenades. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Kern has demonstrated over and again that he is more interested in um, calling people names or um, launching false accusations rather than working together. Um, we need people in the legislature who will work together. So um, all my life, I have learned that we all do better when we're listening and working together, and I will be working together for you. I've been listening to thousands of people in our district um, and would 